Well, good morning again. That was a bit dead. Good morning again. Thank you. Samson and Delilah. Now, how many of you sneak previewed this and had a little read? To re oh, does that mean you're all that familiar with the story? I'm very impressed. For those of you who need to uh, refresh your minds on Deborah, tomorrow's character, you will find that in Judges chapter 4, a slightly uh, less well-known story. But this morning, Samson and Delilah from Judges 16. And again, I think it might be uh, as helpful if you just turn to that, ready for it in a moment, but listen to this particular part of the story of Samson. Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah, who lived in the Valley of Sorek. The leaders of the Philistines went to her and said, find out from Samson what makes him so strong and how he can be overpowered and tied up securely. <clears throat> then each of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Sam Samson, Please tell me what makes you so strong and what it would take to tie you up securely. Well, <laughs> if I'm tied up with um, new bowstrings, new bowstrings that haven't been dyed or dried, I I'll be, well, you know, as weak as, as anyone. So the Philistine leaders brought Delilah seven new bowstrings, and she tied Samson up with them. She had hidden some men in one of the rooms of her house, and she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson snapped the bowstring strings as if they were string that had been burned in a fire, so the secret of his strength was not discovered. Afterwards, Delilah said to him, you made fun of me and told me a lie. Now, please tell me how you can be tied up securely. Oh, if I'm tied up with brand new ropes, brand new ropes that have never been used, I'll be as weak as anyone else. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him up with them. The men were hiding in the room as before, and again Delilah cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson snapped the ropes from his arms as if they were thread. Then Delilah said, You've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Please tell me how you can be tied up securely. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> If you weave the seven braids of my hair <laughs> into the fabric on your loom and tighten it with, with the loom shuttle, I'll, I'll be as weak as, as anyone else. So, while he slept, Delilah wove the seven braids of his hair into the fabric and tightened it with the loom shuttle. Again, she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson woke up, pulled back the loom shuttle, and yanked his hair away from the loom and the fabric. Then Delilah pouted. How can you say you love me when you don't confide in me? You've made fun of me three times now, and you still haven't told me what makes you so strong. So... Day after day, she nagged him <laughs> until he couldn't stand it any longer. Finally, Samson told her his secret. Oh, for goodness sake. My hair has never been cut. I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from my birth, and, and if my head were shaved, my strength would leave me. It would leave me. It would leave me, and I wish you'd leave me too, and I would become as weak as anyone else. 
Delilah realized he had finally told her the truth. So she sent for the Philistine leaders. Come back one more time, for he has told me everything. So the Philistine leaders returned and brought the money with them. Delilah lulled Samson to sleep with his head in her lap. And she called in a man to shave off his hair, making his capture certain. And his strength left him. Then she cried out, Samson, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. When he woke up, he thought, oh, I'll do as I did before. I'll, I'll, I'll go out and shake myself free. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. So the Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza, where he was bound with bronze chains and made to grind grain in the prison. But before long, his hair began to grow back. Amen. Well, thank you. <laughs> you don't know how much fun it is to be married to Delilah, I can tell you. It's, uh... <clears throat> I hardly know where to start this morning with the uh, Bible reading. Several of you very kindly, many of you were here yesterday, you very kindly uh, inquired into the state of my marriage after some of the things I said yesterday. Uh, and I'm ever so grateful for your care and concern and uh, our marriage is still in good shape uh, but I do want to apologize uh, to the line of ladies that were seen queuing up after yesterday's Bible reading in the pastoral center for counseling uh, all of whom's name was Doris uh, and uh, <clears throat> <laughs> If you weren't here yesterday, ask someone who was, uh, and they'll be able to help you. Well, I do hope that you're getting into these Bible characters. Uh, bless you. Are you enjoying Keswick so far this week? I, I hope so. God's been good to us. We've been having a, a wonderful occasions, evening by evening. It's been thrilling uh, to hear Steve uh, and uh, Paul Negroot last night, Charles Price, uh, tonight David Coffey, and so on. It's great to hear the Bible expounded night by night. Uh, and to complement that, here in the mornings, to look at these five Bible characters. Elijah, yesterday, with all his depression and discouragement and brokenness. Today, a man out of control. Samson, a man dominated by his appetites in a, in a quite amazing way. Uh, indeed, Elijah had a problem with a woman, uh, Jezebel. Samson had a problem with several women. Uh, you might begin to think that that's a problem for almost every male Old Testament character. It's not quite true. Tomorrow, we're going to think about a woman who had a problem with a man. Um, so we'll reverse the, uh, uh, the problem. Let me introduce Judges 13, 14, 15, and 16 to you and set this in some kind of context. You may want to have your Bibles open at Judges 13, because we're going to take one or two highlights from the life of Samson uh, and try and help each other this morning to learn from God's holy and powerful word about this incredibly influential judge in Israel. And of course, much of what we'll say will focus on the Samson and Delilah story, but not exclusively, because to understand this incredibly enigmatic figure, we are going to have to understand a little bit about his birth and his life prior to the incident about the hair cutting and the Philistines coming to capture him. What we're doing is we're moving back in time from yesterday. In the great panoply, the great sweep of Old Testament uh, history, uh, we're moving back from the days of Elijah and the kings of Israel and Judah and back in time to a wilder, less organized, less controlled society. The history of the children of Israel is very up and down for sure. 
Almost all the uh, books of the Bible make quite clear that Israelites moved towards God and away from him uh, with almost boring monotony. They didn't seem able to sustain spirituality for a long period. They were able to be spiritual for a while, but the whole Old Testament is a kind of cyclical review of people moving towards God and away from him and back to him after a period of judgment and repentance. And so the Old Testament story uh, sees itself beginning in the garden, as you know, uh, and ending up through a flood story in which Noah and the eight in the ark proved to be the only remnant that survived the great catastrophe that eradicates sinful, rebellious human beings. And then from uh, Noah on downwards to the founding of the nation through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the people of God gradually begin to obtain some kind of identity. That identity is, is hardened, is uh, brought, concretized uh, during the period when famine comes to them and Jacob brings his family uh, to the land. And uh, Joseph's there, as we know, already set up to welcome them. And ultimately, over 400 years or so, the children of Israel gather as an identified community in the land of Goshen. Now, this is this quite significant to where we get to in the, the, the book of Judges because they are expelled in the scene of the ten plagues from Egypt, cast out into 40 years of wilderness wandering, and the external pressures mould them more and more into a nation. Whenever there is persecution, people groups are forced together. And that's precisely what happened in the wilderness wanderings. They were a disparate bunch, but they were forced together by being homeless, landless, and very sad as they were marching towards the promised land. Joshua takes over from Moses, and something of the reverse of that begins to take place as they enter the promised land. The land is fairly quickly subdued. Ai follows Jericho and so on, and those nation cities are defeated, and the Israelites gradually impose their will on the land. But as they do this, uh, what sometimes technically called this Amphictyonic League of Tribes, this, this warring, arguing bunch of Jewish tribes, try and settle this land. And they do so without much coherence. It's not until the end of the judges, the great judge Samuel gives way to Saul and David and so on, that the Philistines are finally crushed. In fact, throughout the book of Judges, the Philistines remain the major enemy in view. Not the exclusive enemy, of course, but one of the major enemies. And the book of Judges is largely the story of these disparate tribes coming together in various alliances to try and conquer and put down the nation states around them or the tribal groupings in order to establish some kind of identity. It's not unlike the early days of the Wild West in the United States, as people pushed from the New England states and the eastern seaboard down south and west through uh, uh, Colorado and, and uh, New Mexico and Texas, ultimately to end on the Pacific seaboard. And you know in those western towns, mob law ruled until someone bigger or stronger turned up. The sheriff was simply the biggest person in town in those early days of settling the Wild West, and then the one who was quickest with a gun. And so life was rough and ready in the West, and in this part of God's history, life is pretty rough and ready, pretty raw. The nation of Israel is not a settled, coherent state with well-established ways of operating. That doesn't come until quite a bit later into the Old Testament. And so the book of Judges reveals a whole series of characters that were a combination of military leader, idiosyncratic, charismatic sort of figure, or a kind of judge, lawgiver kind of figure, or some kind of civil authority figure, or some kind of prophetic figure. It's very difficult to pin the judges down. And that's particularly true in terms of Samson. He's very, very hard to pin down. What kind of person actually was he? So he's a rough and ready tyrant, as it were. When you read about him in a minute, you'll see that he wasn't exactly a peace-loving, normal person. And yet he's God's chosen instrument to begin the process of destroying the Israelite en enemies and moving towards a situation where a more settled society is possible. And God is coming into this. God is, we're going to see, using Samson, even though he's most unlikely material. 
And so Judges 13 shows us the birth of this incredibly enigmatic character. Again, the Israelites, this is Judges 13, verse 1, did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah, which is 14 miles roughly west of Jerusalem, had a wife who was sterile and remained childless but an angel appeared to her and said you are sterile and childless but you are going to conceive and have a son there are interesting echoes uh, here with a number of angelic visitations to women throughout the bible you'll be aware of the abraham and sarah story and her barrenness which ultimately resulted uh, in a child and although the virgin mary uh, was never described as barren and childless an angelic visitation came to her of course uh, in Luke's gospel and Jesus the savior of the world was a result of that angelic visitation so angels arriving and babies arriving seem clearly linked in the pages of the Bible so be careful about angelic visitations <laughs> and uh, this uh, woman is not named she's mentioned 19 times in these early chapters of, uh, of the Samson story but she's not named uh, only the man is named interestingly enough and so they discover that the uh, curse of barrenness, which is, of course, uh, not how we would see it today, but how it was seen in Old Testament times, is alleviated by this incredible gift. Verse 6, the woman went to her husband and told him, a man of God came to me, and he looked like an angel of God. I always think that's a really funny phrase. I'm not sure what an angel looks like. But she was obviously so overawed by his presence, she was crystal clear that something was going on. I didn't ask him where he came from. He didn't tell me his name. Uh, uh, this uh, heightens the sense of mystery, but he did say to me, you're going to conceive and give birth. And then verse 8, in this miraculous birth, this is the first point I want to make this morning. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, I beg you, let the man of God, this angelic character, you sent to us, come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. Samson had the most ideal start to his life and career. Fantastic beginning. An angelic announcement, a miraculous birth in a barren woman, and two parents who were so determined to do what God wanted, they asked for a second visitation from the angel asking for help to raise the son. Now that's pretty remarkable. Samson got what could be described as the ideal start in his life. For those three reasons a miraculous intervention in this woman's womb a divine appointment through an angelic visitor and parents hungry to do the right thing for their boy actually that's a great uh, commendation for all of us as parents perhaps this prayer judges 13 verse 8 ought to be prayed by every potential parent and all of us whose children are growing or even have grown god teaches how to bring up this child. We know that the responsibility of parenthood is a singularly significant one, and we neglect it at our peril. We know that if we abandon our children simply to the mercies of, uh, of the school or the club or their peer group, we know that in the end, they won't be those who love and follow and serve Jesus. Do pray this week while you're at Keswick. If you're listening to this uh, on Premier Radio, you might be thinking of your own church, or if you're listening to it on tape, you might think, wherever you are in the world listening to this, of your own church family, think of those who teach Sunday school, Sunday by Sunday. Pray for them. The raising of the next generation of children. So bad are we as a church in this nation, so failing in our Christian impact, we can't even keep our own children, never mind recruit new ones. And I say that not by any word of condemnation to parents, as you'll see in a moment. And so our commitment is to cry with Samson's parents, God help us raise these children in ways that you want them to be raised. But notice this, that although it's every parent's responsibility to pray the prayer of Samson's parents, notice that Samson perpetually disappointed his parents and failed them. He asked them initially to find him a wife. They were very disappointed with his choice. He often ignored them and couldn't wait for them. And given all that Samson wanted to accomplish, and they thought he would, his life in the moral realm was an almost permanent abject failure. 
I think for two traditional conservative Jews, Samson must have been at one level at least, a deep disappointment to his parents. All they had invested in him, all that fabulous opportunity at the start of his life seems to end up in murder, adultery, visiting of prostitutes, a character out of control. It's a reminder to us, isn't it? That even though some of us have prayed the prayer of uh, Manoah, prayed the prayer of Samson's parents, that our children sometimes grow up to be very different from what we would like them to be. It's a tragedy. It breaks parents' hearts all over the world who are Christians. And yet we remind ourselves, don't we, this morning, that that tragedy occurred even here in the pages of Scripture. Sometimes even when we've done our best, our children are responsible people who must make their own decisions. And sometimes, you know, we beat ourselves with false guilt when our children stray off the path. We sometimes worry, what did I do wrong? Sometimes we may have done things wrong and we need to learn those lessons. But on many occasions, Christian parents are simply faced with a child choosing something else as they have a right to do so. So I want to encourage you this morning that if you're a parent whose child is far from God, Samson's parents would have understood something of the pain, something of the sadness, something of the anguish that many of you will feel this morning. Because, you see, this is the second thing we note from uh, Samson. Samson lives a life in which his appetites are in control, not God in control. This is a story that would do credit to any soap opera script. This is an amazing, an amazing man. The child is born supernaturally. 13, uh, 24 and 25 says that the Spirit of God began to stir him while he was there. But what does he do? He says, now get me a Philistine woman for a wife, even though I shouldn't be marrying this woman from our enemies. Verses 3 and 4. His parents are appalled at the horrible uh, uh, deceit and, and uh, terrible betrayal of his Judaism. Get her for me. She's the right one for me. 14 verse 3 says, the arrogance of that against all the advice, not just of parents, but the betrayal of his Jewish roots and all that God wanted him to be faithful to. Then look at this, this appetite out of control. Suddenly a young lion came towards him and the Spirit of God gives him incredible power to tear the lion apart. And then he goes to this bride, he goes as the bridegroom to this woman, and, and there's a riddle involved, verse 12 following, and she can't guess the riddle. How could she? It's far too complicated. So what happens? As she can't guess this riddle, she weeps and pleads because her life is in danger. I feel very sorry for the woman, actually. She could easily have been killed. It's a tragedy to see this occurring, an absolute tragedy to see what is going to happen to her. And so eventually she cajoles Samson into telling the secret of the riddle. And he says in verse 18, if you had not ploughed with my heifer, if you hadn't uh, uh, conned my bride-to-be, you would not have solved my riddle. It's meant to be a kind of rhyme in Hebrew. Almost, if you had not ploughed with this heifer of mine, you would not have solved this riddle of mine. It's, it's that sort of rhyming impression. It's very hard to translate into English. But then he bursts on the Philistines, chapter 15, and ties 300 foxes together and torches their tails. And then he kills people with the, uh, 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 the jawbone of an ass at the end of chapter 15. And then in chapter 16, you've got Samson and Delilah. He visits a prostitute, verses 1 to 4. And then this other Philistine woman attracts his fancy, and he's drawn in relationship to her. Here is a man whose appetites are out of control. One minute he's killing uh, Philistines with a jawbone of a mule in a kind of bloodbath frenzy of temper. The next minute, he's storming off with the town gates up a mountain. He's so angry. Is this the kind of man you would want on your parochial church council? <laughs> or as a Baptist deacon in your church? Probably not. A man whose temper's not under control, his drinking habits aren't under control, his womanizing habits are not under control either. And so the second thing we notice about Samson is that he's not in control. He's not a nice man. He's a man out of control whose habits are uh, dominating him and controlling him. So it's a tragedy in the making. 
appetite's gone wrong. Now, we're not going to look this morning at the whole sexual side of Samson's flaws, because when David comes uh, onto the stage um, in two days' time, we'll be looking at the sexual nature of David's sin with Bathsheba. But this is a far wider question. Actually, I don't think the problem with Samson was fundamentally sexual. It is a problem more broad than that. It's a problem to do with appetites out of control. Samson is simply not able to control himself. And so he is without a uh, uh, peer in his ability, on the one hand, to be the recipient of the power of the Lord, but on the other hand, to be a character out of control. This man fits our modern culture enormously about the expression of our appetites. If we feel something, do it, indulge in it. On Sunday night, Paul Negroot was talking to you about psychologists as diverse as uh, B.S. Skinner or Sigmund Freud and so on. Lots of streams of current thought play into the kind of culture we currently are. There's all the psychological stuff about not repressing your feelings. It will harm you if you keep them down. So give vent to them. Let them free. Let them have expression. Don't hold them in. And then there's a philosophical stream birthed in some of the existentialists at the turn of the last century, culminating in the kind of Nike slogan, just do it. Express yourself. Whatever it takes. I grew up as a teenager in the 60s. If it feels good, do it. My grandparents' generation used to say things like, control yourself. You have to learn to control yourself. A hundred years ago, about your appetites, Christians and non-Christians would say, you must control your appetites. Now our culture says, you must express your appetites. It's a vastly different scene in which we find ourselves. And Samson lives in that scene. A vastly different scene. He, he expresses it with passion and energy. No appetite too depraved for him to get involved in. No excess too much. Everything he does, even killing Philistines, which on the whole was thought to be a pretty good thing, he has to do to excess. You know, a few foxes, fine. 300. Everything about Samson is excess, excess, excess. Appetites out of control. Tony Blair asked what was the most important thing before the last election, said, education, education, education. Ask an estate agent what it is that causes the house to have a value and to increase in value, and they'll say, location, location, location. You ask me what it takes to be a good Christian leader, and I will say to you, character, character, character. Power is essential, of course, but without a character, the fruit of that leadership is very short-lasting. I think it was um, Peter Kuzmich who first said that uh, uh, charisma without character is not credible. And that people simply don't relate in the long term to a leader whose character is not transformed by the living God. And so Samson certainly judged for 20 years. Certainly he was a significant leader in many ways. They'd probably got nobody else. He was the least worst option in terms of the sheriff riding into town. But his character was his failing. And it was ultimately the problem, we'll see in a moment, which led to his defeat, his degradation, and his humiliation. His character. There is a fatal flaw in Samson. His appetites were never under control from being a very young man. And he reaped the fruit of that in his later years. Brothers and sisters, God comes to us this morning. And from this Old Testament character helps us to see that the flaws in our character in our youth, if they are not dealt with, become giants in our middle and older age. Some of us are safe in every way, but our Achilles heel is in an appetite out of control. It might be for food, it might be for status, it might be for attention, it might be for money, it might be for fame, it might be for sexual uh, uh, indulgence, it might be for anything. But if our appetites are not controlled by the Spirit of God, we will ultimately explode in a mess in God's kingdom. So we pray with Samson's parents and we say, God, make us the kind of parents and make us the kind of people who see our children grown up to know you and love you. And even when they don't, God, please help us not to indulge or wallow in false guilt, but to live in your freedom. Secondly, help us, God, to realize that despite the power of this man, his character let him down. Make us godly women and men. 
And thirdly, in this Samson story, let's recognize the source of Samson's power. What is the source of Samson's power? You see, it looks, to start with, like the source of Samson's power is his hair. Well done, bless you. Was, it, was I going too fast over here for you? No? Aren't they doing a brilliant job just changing over here and out? How do they sign all this at this sort of speed? It's, a, it's just, um, just incredible. I couldn't actually see them and whether they were signing the Samson and Delilah Bible reading, but I really would have loved to have seen, uh, uh, seen that. So what is the source of Samson's power? Both Delilah and Samson are living under an illusion. They both think the source of Samson's power is his hair. Well, of course, Delilah doesn't know that until the end. But it's quite important to understand that the source of Samson's power is not fundamentally his hair, despite the way the story seems to unfold. If you look through the story from 13 onwards, you'll notice that whenever a miracle occurs, the actual hair business is really not mentioned. Judges 14, verse 6, this is the lion incident. The spirit of the Lord came upon him in power, so he tore the lion apart. And then if you come over to chapter 15 and verse 14, he's bound by these ropes and about to be handed over to the Philistines. The spirit of the Lord came upon him in power and the ropes dropped from his arms and he grabbed the jawbone of a donkey and struck a thousand men. Many of the great feats that Samson accomplished are clearly linked with what? The spirit of the Lord. Now, let's just back up a little, because this is very, very important. The Nazarite vow, which chapter 13 introduces us to, which is what Samson was, were characterized by three external signs. Nazarites, well, there were more than this, actually, but three main ones. One, do not drink wine or strong drink. Avoid that. Two, stay away from dead bodies. And three, do not let a razor touch your hair. Now, you might imagine, therefore, that the source of Samson's strength was his Nazarite vow. But actually, he'd abandoned most of the form of the vow throughout his entire life, avoiding wine and strong drink. That's certainly not what he was doing at all these weddings and festivals he went to. Staying away from dead bodies. Now, tell me how you do that while you're killing a thousand Philistines with a donkey's jawbone. Unless he was wearing gloves or uh, something. I mean, it's a nonsense, isn't it? So Samson's completely failed two out of three of the sort of forms of the Nazarite vow. And what happens in the Delilah story is that Samson, undone by this character flaw, this weakness for his appetite, finally caves in to the whining, tearful pleading of Delilah. Finally caving into that, his hair is cut off. The third and final sign of the Nazarite power is gone. But the power is not really in the hair. And it's quite clear that that's true with the most tragic verse in the whole of the book of Judges. But one of the most tragic verses in verse 20 of chapter 16. Then she calls Samson. The Philistines are upon you. She shaved his head and he awoke from his sleep and he thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. And this is the tragedy. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Notice it doesn't say, and he did not know, he just had a haircut. <laughs> the sign was not the significant issue. The sign was simply the residue of God's call on his life. And it was the final straw where God abandoned him to his fate as the final form, the icon, the token of this power, fell away from him, God abandoned him to his fate. Only temporarily, as we shall see. But God abandoned him to his fate. Now, this is crucial because 
Although in the Old Testament, form and reality, symbol and substance are very close together, even in the Old Testament times, the writers knew that ultimately behind the symbol, the reality was of God's touch in our lives. And that form should not be substituted for reality. If any other boy in Samson's day had grown his hair long, he would not have been strong just because Samson grew his hair long. This used, the long hair thing used to be a real conflict thing between Christian parents and children when I was growing up in the 60s. Some of you remember this. My dad used to say to me, you know, about every other week, son, you get your hair's terribly long, you need to get your hair cut. And he would quote me the verse in the New Testament, it is a shame for a man to have long hair, you see. And I would quote him these verses in Samson, you see, as a riposte. <laughs> Look at that, Dad, I'll be weak if I have my hair cut. <laughs> I mean, exegesis was actually weak on both sides of that argument. Funnily enough, uh, uh, today when I visit my father, uh, his hair is longer than mine. <laughs> I've actually mentioned this to him several times, but he won't come to repentance about it, and I will, uh, I will be speaking to him again. So, you see, the form takes our minds, and it has done for the whole of human race, really. We mistake form for reality. I remember being in Texas on one occasion, walking in a major shopping centre, and uh, it doesn't happen to me very often. I hardly ever go uh, shopping hate it, I'm really glad that, uh, that others do it, don't want anything to do with it, think it's of the devil, you know, all of that. Uh, okay. <laughs> so anyway, we're in this shopping centre in uh, Texas, and we walk past this enormous department store window. And I look in the window, and just as you do, look, you know, you've got to find something to occupy yourself while people are shopping. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we were there, and I walked past this window, you know, for several days, and, uh, you know waiting for Jan to finish doing whatever she was doing. And, and it suddenly struck me that I saw one of the mannequins in the window move. <laughs> and I thought, I can't, I, don't, I can't believe it. And so I went back to the window and looked again, and sure enough, they did move slightly. And what I noticed that I looked through the whole window is that about seven mannequins in this window, all of them were actually real people. And what the shop had done as a kind of advertising feature, replaced these mannequins with real people for the day. And from time to time, people stopped and these mannequins moved in the window. And it was quite a shock to people passing by. And what they'd done, of course, is you see, they'd replaced form with reality. A mannequin isn't a real person, but they replaced form with reality. Now, it's just a fairly humorous example, but can I say to you, that the mistake Samson and Delilah made has been made by churches and Christians down the centuries. We argue in our churches, what about? Usually about form, not about reality. We believe, you see, that when God blesses, certain things happen, and we may well be right. Some of us of a conservative evangelical persuasion are committed to the truth of the Bible, and we wave it around like an icon everywhere. We're proud that our Bible is bigger, thicker, heavier. I know that I'm not completely sound because it's not black. <laughs> this is God's holy and infallible word, we say. We open it, we read it, we display it everywhere. But I tell you, I have been in churches that say they honour the Bible and it's all form and no substance. We want God, God to come in our churches, so we assume we'll sing a few contemporary songs. Those of us with more charismatic inclinations, imagine that if we raise our arms in worship, that God will come. It is possible that when God comes, some of us may want to raise our arms in worship, but we must never confuse form and reality. The power's not in the hair. The power's not in the order of service. The power's not in the time of the service. The power's not in whether you raise your hands or don't raise your hands. Your power's not in your structure. The power's not in a program. The power's not in some new development that comes to our churches. If we put into place, God will show up. The crying need of our churches, my crying need, is not a new program or a new skill. It's the Spirit of God. That is the crying need. 
It was a crying need for Samson to understand. The hair was simply a remnant of blessing in the past. It was a token of what God honoured, but it wasn't the real thing. It was a sign of the reality. We are obsessed in our churches with form and sign and structure. That's what we argue about all the time. God forgive us. The world goes to hell around us while we argue about how, songs, how many songs should be sung or whether the service is long or short or drums or organ. What is wrong with us in the church of Jesus? We mistake constantly form for reality. The hair, the not drinking, the not being in touch with dead bodies. Of course those things were important features of the Nazarite vow. But the power was in the spirit of the living God. And then we also ought to note here that Samson's name comes up again in Hebrews 11. Quite bizarrely, really, he's mentioned with a list of famous saints. He only gets a very brief uh, en passant sort of mention. And yet it really is... Quite staggering, the way he's mentioned in Hebrews 11. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and others who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised. You shut them out of the and so on and so on. He's in the hall of fame, for goodness sake. He'd never make it, would he? We said earlier, he'd never make it onto the leadership team of your church, Woody Sampson. He'd never make it. You imagine voting on him at the church members' meeting. Can you mind doing that? <laughs> Do you have those little reports at your church members' meetings where people become members? Do you ever have those at the front? People stand up and say, now I'd like to recommend Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. They grew up as Christians and were back. Can you imagine someone giving Sampson's church membership report? <laughs> Sampson was called by God, had an absolutely miraculous birth, and uh, is a major judge among the people of Israel. Pastor's a real diplomat, that's all he says. Are there any questions? <laughs> church meetings are great, aren't they, really? Some church meetings. It's where a group of individual Christians who all love you behave like the devil when they're together. That's a really, a really bizarre thing. <laughs> and so someone asks a question, and they say, yes, I, I've got a question. Is it true that Samson has had a variety of girlfriends and sleeps with prostitutes? And the pastor says, yes, I, there are rumours to that effect, that effect, that's true, but he's basically a nice guy. <laughs> Is it true that he kills people with animal bones? <laughs> well, some. <laughs> I mean, he wouldn't make it, would he? He wouldn't make it into our church membership. Never mind, into our church leadership. And yet, here is something. Our gracious God, without for one moment condoning this man's appetites out of control, Samson is still used by God. I find that so encouraging. Now, it's, of course, not an encouragement to sin, but it is an encouragement to realise that in my failure and in my error and in my sin, God still wants to use you and still use me. This out-of-control man still finds himself in the Israelite hall of faith. Praise God for that. And actually, you know, the story ends after the Delilah incident with Samuel at his, Samson at his most degraded, most humiliated. And in those moments, God still uses him. His eyes are put out in a horrific uh, incident. He's taken away by the Philistines. And brought out, perhaps some months or even years later, as a figure of fun at a Philistine carnival. And um, there he is, in that great immortal phrase of John Milton's writing about this, eyeless in Gaza. Horrible, horrible picture. Broken, his hair now growing long. Again, the power's not in the hair, because as you notice what he does at the end, he realizes he's come back to this God because as they praise Dagon, it really does get Samuel's goat, Samson's goat and he's, he's angry. And so he cries out, O sovereign Lord, this is verse 28 of chapter 16, remember me, O God, please strengthen me just once more. It wasn't because his hair had grown back that he was able to do this final act, but because God strengthened him to be able to do it. With one blow... 
get revenge on, my Philist on the Philistines for my two eyes. It's not a particularly godly motive, the motive of revenge. And yet the writer reminds us that he killed more people in his death than he had in the whole of his life. And actually that was quite significant because the Philistines with their god Dagon, who was first thought of as a kind of fish god and then a grain god, a god who dominated this part of the ancient world, they first thought that this god, the Philistines, was going to take over this whole community and Yahweh will be squeezed out. And so it's quite symbolic that Samson, as a picture of the whole of Israel, crushes the mighty Dagon in his death throes as all these people are collapsing around him as the pillars are broken as Samson causes the temple to fall. But when does God use him? Again, this, this is a, a moment for me of enormous encouragement. Samson's an enigmatic fact, character. I can't understand quite why he's included in the pages of the Old Testament. I would much prefer God to use nicer people, people easier to predict. But no, God takes this man and he's eyeless, broken, shattered, a mocked figure of fun, a, a parody of himself, a shadow of that great mountain of a man striding around, uh, womanizing and tearing gates off cities and striking fear into the hearts of the Philistines. He's a nothing. And at the point of his nothingness, he does more than he did in all his somethingness. Folks, the great thing about the Samson story is really it's a lesson about what not to do. It's a lesson not to rely on human ingenuity, strength and skill, and not even to rely on religious tokens, but to rely wholly on the Spirit of God. And it's a lesson too that when we are at our most broken, our most defeated, our most despairing, and we feel all hope is gone, it is at precisely that moment that God is able to come into our lives and restore us and raise us up. Isn't that fantastic? That on our deepest moment, our darkest moment, Samson is a great illustration of horror, of failure, of awfulness. And in his dark moments, and he's not just dark spiritually, he's literally dark, he can't see. God's light bursts for one final time in a revelation in this power encounter. Given Dagon on the one hand and Yahweh on the other, there is no contest in God's mind. Dagon must fall. The Philistines must be crushed and defeated. And that route was to go on through many years until David, ultimately King David, comes and sort of mops up most of the remains and establishes his authority. Samson, rescued in catastrophe, rescued in defeat, rescued in brokenness. So Samson begins so well and ends with a glimmer of light, but most of the years in between are disastrous in terms of his character and his behavior. We remind ourselves this morning that whatever the miraculous start, it's the continuing of the journey with God which is crucial. We remind ourselves of the fatal flaw in Samson and the undoing in us of any appetite out of control, of the fact that it's not the form that matters but the power of the Spirit of God and that in the moment of degradation where some of us feel this morning utterly utterly broken, that God can use us more in our emptiness than he can when we're full of ourselves. So we praise God. It's just a situation over here where we need a first aid person just to come uh, to help us in the tent, please. That would be really great. Just help this man who's obviously quite unwell. If we could do that, that would be really super. Tell you what, I'll just, I'll just finish there and I'll pray for him. Uh, will you join me as we pray? Uh, just a special prayer for our brother. Uh, and then uh, we'll just close, or Steve, whatever we need to do. Let's just pray. We'll come back to some of this material tomorrow if we need to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're a God of healing power and a God of grace. And we, uh, we really pray that our brother right now will know your touch in his mind and body. Please be close to him. Give aid to the medics and give concern and care for them. I'm sure he feels right now um, pretty broken and sad. Please help him, Lord, in these moments. And surround his family, too, with your love and your care. And uh, guide us today as we try and live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, bless you, folks. If you could probably... Shall I close the meeting, Steve, or are you going to?
just need to leave the tent, certainly avoiding this sort of area here. 